Hello everybody and welcome to another video about my musical proclivities where I'll be blathering and rambling about uh, all the albums I've been listening to in the last days and weeks and um, yeah and this time it will actually be a bit of a roller coaster ride going up and down because um, first uh, I um, thought I will uh, talk about something very particular and that is uh, the fact that in some way I have been uh, blacklisted on YouTube. Now uh, it's a funny thing because uh, um, well it is a it is a known fact and it is a fact that has not been denied by YouTube that uh, there is a kind of an algorithm going on that uh, keeps deleting people's uh, comments under videos. So basically you write your comment, you push submit and you can see your comment for like a second or two. But if you reload the video, the comment is gone, it's deleted. And um, yeah, so that's what's kind of happening. But uh, it happens on a different scale to different people, which is kind of interesting. So. Um, some people make the experience that uh, when they comment under, let's say, 20 different videos, make 20 different comments, then like two of them are getting deleted. And this has been explained away with this algorithm that is kind of uh, controlling, um, automatically controlling YouTube against hate speech and uh, uh, spreading of lies and fake news and all this. Uh, and um, this may be to some extent true, but just the amount of people that make the experience that uh, a comment is getting deleted that could not have included any relevant keywords, uh, the amount of those people is growing. So it kind of suggests a different idea that while this is going on, there is also the fact that different people have a different rating as uh, users. And uh, if your rating is getting bad, uh, it means that uh, the algorithm is maybe harsher uh, up to the point where it basically does not matter what you write into the comment, it will always get deleted. For example, just a few days ago I have uh, written a comment under a video that included only one word and the word was what, which is W, H, A and T. Um, so. Um, so it would be pretty harsh if uh, some uh, algorithm would consider that a kind of a controversial keyword uh, because uh, it makes you wonder what is left of the language to actually use. Is it possible that I have insulted or offended someone on YouTube and by doing so set all these things into motion? Absolutely. Now the interesting thing is that uh, this idea that uh, different people have a different kind of a social media rating on YouTube is highly speculative. But the problem is that uh, YouTube is no, not transparent there. I mean, Google will give you no information. I mean, I wrote to I wrote to YouTube. I kind of followed the channel. I just said, look, it seems like every of my comments is getting deleted. So um, I would like to know why. Um, you get an answer that is through and through completely ridiculous. It's basically kind of a half automated statement that tells you that uh, yeah, it's there is a certain likelihood that your comment ended up in the spam folder of uh, the owner of the channel under which video under whose video you have posted your comment, um, which again does not make any sense because uh, if it was random then some of my comments would actually get through so uh, obviously it is not random obviously it has to do with the uh, rating uh, people due to their behavior which you know what to some extent i find it more or less acceptable i don't write it ex i don't find it acceptable as a kind of a state ideology the way that the Chinese are doing it now where basically every citizen of People's Republic China has a social media rating uh, that is kind of governmental and yeah they kind of remove you from the equation if you misbehave so 
that's uh, something that has happened a lot. Um, but uh, I understand that Google and YouTube, that this is a private company, so it's their house rules. And if they think that people should behave in a certain way, yeah, they can, uh, they can demand that. But then I expect from YouTube that they kind of call me on the carpet and say, look, we can see here the history of your comments. Those are the things that we had blocked because we don't agree with that statement. This is uh, in conflict with our policy. This would be completely acceptable. And then they would probably say, well, and now we need to punish you. So for the last, for the next three months, you will not be able to post anything. Again, I'm not entirely against the idea of punishment. But it's really odd when this happens and then you kind of demand an explanation. You want to know what am I being charged and the answer is what you think is happening is not happening. It's an illusion. It does not happen. No one is blocking your comments. No, no, no. So so is it like coincidence that each, each one of my last 50 comments has been blocked? Now, there is a reason why I'm telling you all this. Um, there is a reason why I'm telling you all this, particularly in a VC video. You want to see records, right? Not me blathering about this. But there's a reason, because honestly, um, I, I don't care that much about social media. And uh, so while a part of me really does not care, and I don't need to uh, react to some crazy people's videos and explaining them why I think that they need head medication. I don't need that. But uh, there is this one slim segment of my, uh, let's say, online behavior or online daily routine where this actually does sting me a little and that is the VC community. Because uh, those are kind of the only people where I... Uh, communicate or, or, or react react to their videos somewhat from the heart so to speak so in this case it's kind of a, a, a bit of a problem and that's why i'm talking about it because um, i certainly don't want those vinyl fellows of mine to think that i just don't care that uh, i may be expecting them to visit my channel and watch my videos and comment under my videos but um, it's beneath me to do it myself it's not the case i mean i have uh, um, tried to comment just in the last two or three days probably under well at least seven or eight of your videos and it all got uh, deleted um, I believe some of you may have actually received uh, a email if you have a if you have a kind of particular setting where every time someone comments under your video you kind of get the content the well the the entire comment copied into an email and sent to you and this is what happened to me that some of you have just uh, wrote me back and kind of puzzled let look I received this comment as a video as as a email alert. But uh, when I looked under the video, the comment was gone. So it kind of, it even, to some extent, it looks like I'm commenting somewhere and then changing my mind and deleting my own comment right afterwards, which is just not happening. So that's kind of the only the only angle of this whole problem, which it's really not a problem for me at all. I, like I like how I. How I don't give a shit if YouTube lets me, allows me to comment under some idiot's video. Really, I really could not care less. I do not belong to this uh, segment of human civilization that believes that social media is kind of the sa on the same value level as oxygen and water and sustenance. <laughs> no, it's not. It's not. It's usually it's just. A giant pile of excrement and from time to time it rubs me the wrong way and um, the good old Socrates disciple in me is not shy just to express some animosity from time to time and uh, while intelligence might be sometimes a little tricky to truly 
detect on a philosophical level stupidity never is it shows much clearer stupidity is not fuzzy <laughs> stupidity is obvious anyway so uh, I want to turn this into kind of a shout out because uh, those I want I want to call out I made a little list here I want to call out all those channels of VC fellows whose videos I have watched in the last days and uh, all those video all those channels uh, I could not make any comment under your video so I really apologize for that mm. um, of course big star 1000 in Australia just I've seen your latest video just the uh, day before yesterday and I even didn't try to comment under it because at this point it was clear to me that uh, this is not gonna happen of course, um, Jeff Calico Silver really enjoyed your video about uh, songs from the woods and uh, heavy horses. Um, made a wonderful comment, <laughs> kind of describing my point of view. Got deleted immediately. Graham Allen, whom I, by the way, call Captain Allen, and he knows exactly why, um, and who was in Prague not that long ago. My old hood from the days when I was a teenager. I grew up in Prague. Um, again, could not answer, uh, could not could not comment under your video. Same goes to uh, Richard, the vinylizing progger, a uh, great source of uh, progressive rock recommendation and amazing music from uh, Scandinavia. A channel I can really recommend if you are into kind of serious progressive rock music. Uh, uh, also a little bit beyond the usual big five names and you know exactly which names I mean Steve Carlson of course um, the man on the road um, really enjoy your atmospheric uh, opening segments in front of the video love them much more than I loved your singing years ago at the beginning of every video <laughs> So uh, for me, this is a uh, big improvement uh, high up on the Brian Eno scale. So I uh, really love this kind of a strange, uh, almost uh, abandoned, I would even say dystopian uh, sense of Americana um, that uh, often come with your videos uh, in, these first two, in these first 30, 40 seconds of every clip. Then there is John Bellamy, another great source for progressive rock, uh, particularly kind of a European prog rock, uh, and the jazz fusion music. Um, and I will uh, mention you again a little later when I go through my records. Finally, when I finally get to the to the actual topic uh, of the video. Yeah, so those were uh, I think like seven uh, seven channels uh, that are kind of like my prime uh, VC go to channels these days, uh, and whose videos I could not comment comment in the last days just because uh, Mr. Google doesn't think I am worthy, and um, yeah, so um, I'm in a doghouse now. I'm one of the bad guys. I'm a bad dog. So um, I just want you to know that uh, I'm just I'm not ignorant or arrogant uh, towards uh, your channels and um, I've just uh, been gagged I have a gag in my mouth so let's talk about music so um, I have a lot of I have this time a lot of stuff and it's extremely eclectic I mean I know in, the, in my last last VC videos Mostly, uh, it was always about jazz fusion or kind of a oriental jazz, uh, North African sound and stuff like that. But this time, it's quite different. Let me begin with this album here. Um, and uh, it's kind of a funny experience for, for me. And I'm, of course, talking about Genesis selling England by the pound. I think it's 1973 this album or 74 I think 73 now um if you if you look like and I'm I'm a sucker for those things if you look like through videos of people ranking Genesis this is a strong contender for three two or one almost everybody who's kind of serious about Genesis has this album in their top three probably 
and it's only a matter it's only a question if they prefer uh lamb lies down on broadway more or maybe foxtrot etc now <laughs> i'm not a big fan of this album to be honest and uh, there are reasons for that but um in my defense i keep trying really hard i keep trying for over 30 years now, over 30 years, I keep picking this album up and giving it a try. Deeply hoping that one day some kind of curtain will fall and I will understand what all the fuzz is about. Now, do I hate this album? No. Do I think it's a brilliant album? Yes. Uh, do I enjoy this album? Yeah, kind of yes. But uh, it always happens with the same dynamic. I kind of jump into it like, okay, I wake up and think today I'm going to listen to selling England by the pound and then I just start you know and dancing with the moonlit night and it's all kind of great and you know uh, I know what I like in your wardrobe da, 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 da. it's fantastic yes and Firth of Fifth yes Steve Hackett guitar solo famous no. but then I come to the second side and as the second side kind of progresses um Kind of my energy kind of goes down and down and after a while it's like oh there's a lot of obnoxious stuff going on on this record so in the every time i finish this record i'm, I'm strangely a little angry i don't know why i try to i try to understand what makes me so angry about this record um so I give it a thought because uh, I still have to take care of this giant uh, German Shepherd dog uh, and um, so I spend like almost two hours every day in the forest running around with headphones and uh, which is a great time because I get to listen like three albums easy, uh, two or three albums every day just that way so believe me I love mp3s because uh, I can really use them. So I listened to Selling England by the Pound and just was thinking about what, what I like about it and what I don't like about it. I like about it that it's a great sounding whimsical album with some great, uh, even some riffing and some uh, brilliant ideas and it's all fine and well. But there are things about it that I find strange and first of all, and I'm probably not the first one to utter this complaint, but... Uh, Imagine you're in the 70s and imagine you have a band with a good name. And imagine your lead guitar player is Steve Hackett. Is this really the type of album you want to record? I got I want to tell you something and this is basically a standard operating uh, procedure for me. After I listen to this album, I usually have to listen. It's like a reflex. I have to listen to this album. The Voyage of the Acolyte by Steve Hackett because uh, this is how Selling England by the Pound should have sounded in my book. Uh, for me a much better album, much more interesting and uh, it's, it's a known fact and people have said this before that uh, Steve Hackett uh, in some parts was strangely underused in, in Genesis and yeah I blame Tony Banks of course um, but um, I mean Yes, there is this amazing historical guitar solo on Firth of Fifth, uh, but just to get to the solo, you have kind of go through this uh, giant uh, cathedral of uh, Tony Banks piano playing that kind of sounds like some small town uh, piano teacher that's trying to impress his pupils. Kind of like, look, this is what you will be able to play one day. Once you are grown up and allowed to have sex. And it's, I don't know, it's just, the entire album is just this strange, strange brew of, uh, of keyboard stuff. Uh, where everybody else is kind of pushed to the background. I have nothing against uh, Tony Banks. I like Tony Banks. I like his playing. I like him with Genesis. And I also don't want to create the impression that I kind of hate this album. Because I really like this album to some extent. But honestly, it's 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 becoming one of those records that are much healthier for me just as a source of individual tracks. But uh, in one way through, it's kind of like, ah, uh, 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 it's kind of, I can't explain that. It's like, 
like something draining the energy out of me. The other thing, and that's probably much more important um, than um, the Steve Hackett situation, is that it's just so plastered over with Gabriel's vocals. I mean, it's so much lyrics. Oh, so much lyrics. I mean, this goes on and on. And this is generally my problem with Genesis in the Gabriel era, this idea that you can only understand our album if you leave, if you read the preface, you, you have to get the gatefold sleeve. Inside the gatefold sleeve there will be like a 10,000 word text. You have to read this first before you start to listen to anything. And then you need to read the lyrics and it's six pages, so be ready. It's like, oh man, really? Does he have to sing so much all the time? And uh, <laughs> because honestly, it's not like I don't dislike I don't dislike exotic uh, whimsical ideas and um, but uh, compare it compare it with Kate Bush kind of same mindset to some extent as a lyricist but Kate Bush three verses one refrain idea delivered and if this idea should take longer than this then maybe the idea is not that worth of telling but um, anyway. I wonder what you think about this album. I think it's a great album. It's quite wonderful. But uh, if I was to make a Genesis ranking, this would never ever end it on my number one. <laughs> it's and I yeah, it's kind of uh, I don't know. I like Further Fifth. I, I love this Hackett solo, but it feels it feels like yeah. Why can't it be like that the entire album? Why 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 do I get these three minutes? Where he suddenly sounds like Robert Fripp, and, um, and the rest of the time you, you can you can literally you listen to this, and you literally feel you really you really can see it you can see it in front of your imaginative eye like Tony Banks in the mastering studio saying like put him down put him down the guitar is too loud no 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 too loud too loud bass more in the background drums too loud too loud too loud. It's all too loud. I'm pretty sure during these recording sessions and the mixing sessions, no one said to Tony Banks, uh, Tony, I think <laughs> you are all over the place now. Let's dim your keyboards a little bit. So uh, it's not this. This was not a. This was not a rant. Um, really, I have nothing against this album. I just find it funny because I've spent now over 20 years to really, really like it, and um, I kind of get only. Um, only to the point where I kind of like it but uh, yeah this type of music is not for everyone uh, but uh, honestly um, you may not believe it but I I prefer Trespass to this album most definitely Trespass is a much better record oh uh, yeah um, uh, and that's even without Hackett right so anyway um, uh, I have been listening to this record here because I bought it not that long ago and this is uh, Rosetta by Vangelis. Uh, yeah, it's one of those. This came out on, uh, on, on, on vinyl as well. I think as a double album probably and um, this is exactly an example of this type of music where I just kind of hold on for a second and just imagine Vangelis' music for a second and then make a decision if this lends itself more to a CD format or vinyl format. And I mean, I have a lot of uh, Vangelis on vinyl, basically his stuff from the old days, kind of out of nostalgia. But honestly, I always felt that his music worked much better on CD. Um, this is a good record. Um, it's a good uh, kind of atmospheric space music, uh, kind of a program music or concept album uh, Kind of musically documenting the Rosetta mission uh, with uh, the Churim of Gerasimenko asteroid. Now that's a mouthful, but it kind of shows that I had a few years of Russian in the school when I still was in Prague. So um, it's kind of good, good, good record. I mean, there are there are themes that are totally cheesy, and as always with Vangelis, I mean. Vangelis was even 40 years ago he was like that uh, some of the stuff is just outstanding and great kind of a spacey space music kind of a science fiction sound uh, if you want to feel like you are in space uh, and some of it is kind of a little 
too cute and too 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 corny but a generally good record um uh, yeah let's get over to uh, vinyl um, I've been listening to Carla Blay and her the Carla Blay band and her album Social Studies uh, this is a wonderful record like basically everything coming from Carla Blay is wonderful it's very eclectic actually um, I mean there are only f six songs on this album but no one composition sounds like the other um, it's it's basically a jazz record but it's quite uh, infused with other styles ranging from the Argentinian tango uh, even uh, with us particularly on the b-side I like the b-side even more it, uh, the b-side is uh, quite fusiony so this is more like jazz fusion uh, going on there so wonderful record uh, if you like uh, jazz music that is on the one hand pretty listenable so she's not a very noisy composer uh, but at the same time she can be very kind of uh, unique and idiosyncratic and uh, so uh, it's not a it's not just the kind of a middle of the road cool jazz album uh, she basically never does that it's there's always something kind of uh, unique and whimsical about it um, Next, yeah, to stay in the jazz genre, uh, this is a great record called Source by Nubia Garcia. Uh, she's a saxophone player, so this is contemporary jazz, I guess very modal, very in parts very busy, in parts very kind of atmospheric, uh, very very enjoyable. I mean I like this album from the beginning to the end. Um, when I heard it the first time, um, I kind of felt like the drummer is showing off a little too much um, it's a very busy drumming on this record um, but uh, actually it's pretty excellent the way he's drumming and um, particularly um, with the bass I think I think the from the way it sounds the bass player is playing a upright bass but probably an electric upright bass um, and um, they have a great, great lock with the, the with the drummer. So this is a wonderful kind of instrumental album um, with uh, contemporary jazz music and uh, very kind of fusiony and uh, very enjoyable. Um, and uh, with all kind of surprising elements, uh, particularly there is kind of stuff on the year that is. Uh, more like a uh, kind of Brazilian uh, Brazilian vibe, touch of sort of Afrobeat and Latin music. Oh, we have a cat here. What's going on? Say something. Yeah. I have no time for you now. Oh yeah, I know. What is this about? Yeah, we have three of them, and they're all needy. Not to mention that dog I talked about. So, should we continue? Can we continue with a cat in the back? Yes. You want to come here? <laughs> All right, let's see how this works. Okay, man, don't waste these cats. You can't eat them. They don't provide anything. They bring some mice home from time to time, which is usually very disgusting. And one of them has a tendency to uh, bring bats <laughs> at night, which uh, in the age of COVID-19 is not a very popular thing to do. Um, but anyway, so uh, more records. Uh, I've been um, listening to Simply Red the last days. Uh, particularly uh, their debut album, Picture Book. Which, um, you know what, this is actually... I mean, I've been listening to this record now a few times from beginning to the end. 
in a sense, this is like one of the strongest debut albums that you can imagine because uh, it's quite it's quite fascinating. This is a really strong album, track by track. Has a lot to say. Um, the music is sounds outstanding, and it's a debut album. So you, I mean, this is a completely fully fledged band that leaves nothing to be desired. So, wow, as a as a uh, Debut album is the first album of a group. Very impressive. It's a great record. Um, um, interesting uh, kind of a feeling of Englishness there. But also combined with this kind of strong uh, critic of capitalism. And kind of the, kind of the, the, the rise of the consumer society of the 80s. Uh, so it was certainly a band that brought a very different vibe uh, to kind of the, the MTV culture. Yeah, so a great record. I uh, really like it. And uh, I also listened to their third album, A New Flame. Um, quite beautifully following the trend. A very good album. Uh, certainly much more in the pop department. Uh, Somewhat less jazzy, but uh, definitely still a strong record uh, and uh, certainly a band that knows how to deliver. Now with this next record, this is a shout out to a uh, culture fan um, who uh, commented uh, under my last VC video and uh, kind of uh, turned me on to this band from America called Oregon. Uh, this is their album Moon and Mind. Particularly because uh, they're one of their key musician here is Glenn Moore, uh, who plays, I think, bass and piano. Because he was, uh, as a culture fan pointed out to me, he was uh, playing on the album uh, Between uh, Dusk and Dawn uh, that I have shown last time. So this is Glenn Moore's actual band here. Um, and they made a lot of albums in the 70s and um, the beautiful music. It's a beautiful blend of uh, kind of Middle Eastern melodies combined with uh, uh, kind of very European classical music and all this is kind of held together with uh, with basically jazz music uh, so it's one of those uh, records uh, that are quite calm and uh, quite exploratory in their nature uh, combining these different cultural paradigms to, to one music. Quite a good record. I really enjoyed this one. This came out of Vanguard. Um, and uh, it's quite a brilliant album. I think this came out in 1978. No, 79 actually. Um, so um, it's an interesting lineup. Uh, uh, with a lot of like tabla playing and kind of a flamenco type of guitars and a very sort of jazzy piano. Um, then I have listened to this wonderful album, My Goals Beyond by John McLaughlin. Um, one of his rather early solo albums, kind of parallel with his uh, work with Mahavishnu Orchestra. And this is an amazing album. Um, I can't understand why this is not a Mahavishnu Orchestra album, uh, despite the fact that, I mean, almost the entire lineup is more or less here. But uh, this is a why Mahavishnu Orchestra was this kind of a fuzzy, distorted, uh, raw, uh, intricate band. Um, this is all just played with acoustic guitar. Um, while at the same time the A side and the B side are quite different in structure and sound because the A side uh, is certainly much more in the wake of McLaughlin's working on Bitches Brew with Miles Davis. I mean it has the A side has kind of this type of vibe, this kind of long modal format of uh, really kind of dark brooding uh, spiritual music while the b-side in a sense 
Uh, it's kind of much sweeter because it's uh, just a series of songs all played solo uh, on the acoustic guitar by John McLaughlin and uh, many of them are kind of jazz classics, some of them are from him. So naturally I kind of feel more drawn to the A-side uh, with these kind of a giant uh, brooding compositions, but um, just the artistry on this record is outstanding, it's epic. And at the same time, it kind of it kind of helped me to understand how this whole Shakti phenomenon was even possible because this was something that always puzzled me. Yes, there are amazing jazz fusion guitar players in the world. Um, if we say like the top ten names, those are just incredible jazz guitar players and uh, everybody has a bit different names by but we would all probably agree on three or four names that would appear in all our lists but um i always thought like what a what a mind job just to become part of shakti just take your kind of a north american european uh, music craft and just suddenly find yourself surrounded by five top-level Indian musicians in an ensemble that is purely Indian music, basically. I mean, could you jump more into the deep end of giant cold water? Um, but uh, if you listen to this album, it kind of starts to make more sense because he, you re realize that uh, he was already kind of working a lot uh, on this type of vibe and music a uh, few years prior to Shakti. So this is a kind of interesting, I find this is kind of interesting, this album bridges kind of Mahavishnu Orchestra and Shakti in quite a wonderful way because it kind of contains uh, a lot from both worlds, if that makes any sense to you. So yeah, my goals beyond Mahavishnu, John McLaughlin. So it came out on the Douglas label and this is a Dutch pressing. Yeah, I've been listening to Introspection by Thijs van Leer. Now uh, Thijs van Leer obviously well known from uh, his uh, work uh, in Focus, uh, but uh, this is very different. This was basically his first solo album and uh, it's more or less a classical album where he plays only the flute the entire time. Um, but in a sense, it's more like a pastiche. So this is not a uh, kind of a pure orchestral presentation of uh, his music or or the performance uh, of some uh, particular classical body of work. It's uh, more like a collection of uh, classical pieces and some compositions that he wrote together with uh, Roger von Otterloh. And uh, yeah, this is a kind of very, very festive almost, uh, but at the same time, sometimes very kind of sentimental and melancholic uh, journey through uh, some famous classical compositions and uh, intertwined with his own music. Uh, but uh, at the same time, in his own uh, typical way, he puts a certain spin on the music, but it's very subtle. Uh, so uh, most certainly this is the type of album where you have to be in the mood for it. And uh, kind of a good record for a Sunday afternoon. Uh, and, um, and you can hear he's a really wonderful flute player. Uh, probably far too overlooked as such. Um, some great vocal contributions by Letty de Jong. Uh, kind of operatic... Uh, providing kind of operatic, uh, more like Baroque uh, vocal parts uh, to the arrangements. So yeah, this is a very nice album. This came out in 1972. So kind of a parallel project uh, to, uh, to his work with Focus at that time. Thijs van Leer, Introspection. So I discovered this record through uh, John Bellamy. He showed it on his channel and this is called Between Flesh and Divine. By Asia Minor. Now, of course, um, I was immediately interested because on the one hand it's progressive rock, on the other hand uh, this band is 
kind of 50% a Turkish band and 50% a French band. So this is already something that got me interested. Um, this is a re-release here on Rainbow Records. It came out 2015. Nice gatefold sleeve. Uh, so I bought it as a new copy. This sounds wonderful. This is brilliant, uh, beautifully sounding music uh, that uh, I guess the other band that I would compare it uh, as a reference would probably be Camel, kind of in their prime years. It has this kind of a uh, uh, soft-spoken kind of Camel vibe with a lot of flute playing, but at the same time uh, it kind of beautifully leads into yeah, kind of riff-oriented groovy music and uh, it's all very adventurous and on a kind of large canvas uh, cinematic prog rock just exactly the way we like it. it has big kind of 70s uh, feel to it now this album originally came i think uh, this by the way a limited edition with which, which is kind of num which is numbered here which came out in thousand copies but this album originally came out in 1980 um, and yes, I would like to take the opportunity to uh, point out the irony here, because uh, yes, there is this other band that has a similar name. I mean, Asia Minor or Asia Minor is how the Romans called the Turkey in the, those days. This was kind of the Anatolian province was called Asia Minor or in translated English, uh, Small Asia. Now there is an there is the big Asia, the other band that came out in the eighties, right? Asia. Now I find it so funny because this came out nineteen eighty, and uh, the sound is completely uncompromising. I mean, at this point in time, all the big, big uh, names of progressive rock either folded or desperately worked on their transformation into pop acts and uh, some of them did it well and some of them did it not so well um, but there was also Asia and let me tell you I usually I don't I don't spend my time if you if you watch my VC videos uh, you know that I just don't trash other bands and I don't I don't want to um, I don't want to taint other people's experience with music. This is not my job. It's not my job to tell you, oh, I think this music sucks and this album is bad. And I, I try to find good things in almost every record. Uh, I do fail, but if I don't like it, then I shut up about it and I don't talk about it. But you know what? In the case of Asia, I want to um, make an exception because Asia sucks. Asia is one of the biggest disappointments of my kind of personal musical journey because these four coked up morons have arrived at the musical stage at the beginning of the 80s presenting themselves as this like oh this gotta be a progressive supergroup like you've never heard before yeah and then I listened to their first album and it's just a pile of garbage it's it's not even well played that's the problem i mean a lot of progressive rock musicians think like hey we've been doing complicated stuff our entire career pop is easy for us but believe me believe me when i tell you yukihiro takahashi is 10 times better drummer than carl palmer when it comes to pop material carl palmer is a shitty pop drummer i mean really if he was, if Carl Palmer was forced to feed himself by being a session player for pop music, man, he would have become probably an accountant or something. So um, I remember when Asia came out, I just, this was such a pile of dishonest garbage by guys folding this shit in. And why do I think it's it matters? It matters because once you have achieved a certain role within a certain cultural paradigm then you have just a certain duty you have a duty just to try to push the envelope and yes you can say yeah but we don't care anymore because uh, we are growing fat and we need money we need money to buy cocaine we can't just uh, make progressive music anymore so that's okay. You can say, hey, here is Steve Howe and here is John Wetton and from now on we are pop artists. That's fair. But this is not how they sold <laughs> themselves at the beginning. And I know because I was there. 
I'm old enough to remember they kind of tried to sell this shit show as a progressive rock album. So, uh, in the heat of the moment. But this is a hundred times better record than anything that Asia ever did. And that's wonderful. They did this 1980 and they really, really did not care about uh, expectations and trends and uh, punk rock, uh, whatever. So, great record. Uh, uh, thank you, John, uh, for pointing this out in your video because I really enjoyed this album. Quite fantastic. Uh, great example of timeless uh, progressive rock uh, by a France, French based band uh, with uh, French and Turkish musicians. Uh, excellent. Yeah, Between Flesh and Divine by Asia Minor. Yeah, I'm on a roll today, isn't it? But this is an incredibly long video. I don't know if this is supposed to... Maybe I cut it into pieces or something. No one's gonna watch this. This is a wonderful record here. Wow, this is a great record. Now, uh, I had this one kind of on my list for months and months and just coincidentally never bought it. But then uh, I saw it in one of the last videos by Big Star 1000 and I thought, okay, now I have to get it because uh, this is getting ridiculous. This is Jakob Derwort uh, in the Chief Factory and the album Bamboo Music. Uh, this, this entire record is a type of uh, fourth world music uh, meditation. Uh, very playful and full of field recordings combined into kind of atmospheric music. Uh, if you like Oyukai Conjugate, if you like John Hassel, you have to have this record because this is quite beautiful. Uh, perfectly kind of listenable in the foreground as much as it beautifully works in the background, kind of accompanying your day uh, as a kind of a acoustic uh, wallpaper but at the same time it's 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 very it's it's full of interesting ideas so it's very avant-gardistic so uh, you can uh, really kind of give it a listen and pay attention to it now Jakob Derwert uh, is unfortunately has, has passed away three years ago and this record is kind of like a montage or like a uh, I wouldn't even call it it's not a compilation it's kind of a rearrangement it's kind of a restructuring of uh, of, uh, of certain mosaic pieces and fragments of his music into this kind of uh, obituary type of album or kind of an epilogue to his work um, and it works pretty well it's a great record um, I enjoy this a lot and uh, yeah, certainly another another kind of uh, mosaic stone in uh, my fourth world journey. Um, this one uh, was certainly overdue. This is a record um, that I discovered through Graham Allen. Uh, this is David Sanctions and Tone. The album is called True Stories. Uh, so, um, of course, David Sanctions, well-known uh, keyboard player organist and guitar player and uh, on the one hand um, quite prolific solo artist but on the other hand uh, someone who played on dozens and dozens and dozens quite big recordings with huge superstar type of uh, artists uh, as, a, as, a, as a studio musician. Um, this is a kind of a keyboard ori oriented fusion meets prog rock album. I think um, I think the the American edition comes in blue, while this is uh, the German pressing. And I don't know how this was released in UK. I think the red, this kind of a Bordeaux red edition was for the entire uh, Europe European theater. Um, this came out on Electrola on Emmy, and is an album that came out in 1978 and was co-produced uh, between uh, David Sanctus and Eddie Offord. Now this always uh, makes me interested because I think Eddie Offord uh, probably one of the best uh, sound engineers and producers of all times in my book. But uh, that's only reflecting my own proclivities. Yeah, so this is a great kind of a keyboard oriented, organ oriented, jazzy, fusion prog rock 
album with all kind of a funky moments, uh, certainly grooving a lot and uh, very playful on the keyboard. Um, I fully agree with Graham that uh, the sound when this album was released was already a little, little missing uh, the the zeitgeist uh, at this point. Uh, if he had released this album like five years earlier, it had probably it would have probably become like one of these epic uh, kind of fusion milestones next to Herbie Hancock and uh, Weather Report. Um, but. Uh, Nonetheless, uh, this is a kind of a great album and uh, kind of cool, uh, energetic uh, rock album with a lot of uh, keyboard solos and uh, a lot of kind of jazzy, proggy elements going on. So, um, True Stories, uh, David Sanctuous and Tone from 1978. Then I was listening to Tilt by Cosy Powell. Um, yeah. I'll <laughs> Tilt is a uh, decent record. Um, I can't say that I was too uh, carried away by it. Uh, it's one of those records that have uh, quite an insane lineup because uh, you have like Jack Bruce playing bass here. Uh, you have uh, Neil Murray from Whitesnake playing bass here. You have uh, the before mentioned David Sanctuous on keyboards. There are even two tracks here recorded with uh, Don Airy and Gary Moore, so you kind of get this uh, Colosseum 2 vibe going on. Uh, there is uh, Mel Collins on saxophone, and the vocals are sang by Alma Gantry, um, of all people. So um, it's kind of a very, very eclectic, almost idiosyncratic album, but at the same time, um, it's not I mean, for me. This is kind of a middle of the road uh, rock music, um, but uh, there certainly are moments, particularly on the B side, uh, that um, have something a little more to them, a certain certain uh, fusion vibe, and um, yeah, not a bad album. Um, not something I would want to listen uh, quite too often, but uh, definitely not a waste of time. The next album is something a little less known, uh, but. Uh, Actually, quite a pleasant listen. This is Sky Racer by uh, the Air Force Band. And Air Force Band was basically a kind of a studio band uh, that was recording um, library music uh, for the UBM label. The UBM wa was the label of Uwe Buschgötter, who together uh, with the composer Manfred Schof basically wrote the music on this album, while uh, this band... Uh, Air Force did record it. Uh, so this is all basically jazz funk, very much in the style of Passport. And there are indeed some musicians from Passport playing here, particularly Willi Ketzer on drums and Dieter Petereit on bass. You have Rainer Brüninghaus playing here, who is a piano player that uh, is actually from the Jan Gabarek group. Um, so yeah, this is a, definitely a kind of a pleasant uh, little bit in the elevator music department album but kind of cool I mean I, I kind of like this the jazz funk vibe going on here and so that's a uh, sky racer it's a good copy sounds nice and a cool sound uh, and my final vinyl record here is uh, something I don't listen to every day but from time to time it's actually kind of funny it's uh, the album Environment by Claude Larson. And uh, it's actually, this runs under the moniker of Claude, or the, or the name of Claude Larson, but it's actually recorded by two guys, Claude Larson and Christian Brun. Christian Brun is also famous for uh, composing and recording the amazing uh, Captain Future title melody. Um, so yeah, this is a pure late 70s, early 80s uh, synthesizer album. Actually late 70s, this was recorded in 1978. Uh, so uh, if you like kind of late 70s analog synth sound, then this is uh, basically just a giant porn album for you. <laughs> because uh, this is a kind of pure, pure synth um, album with without any other instruments basically um, and um, 
So in a sense, it's kind of a, one of those pioneering uh, electronic albums. So uh, I have just a stack of five CDs here that are all from ECM, our favorite label. And um, it's particularly, again, because I was uh, watching a video by Big Star 1000 and he had shown uh, some uh, music by Anwar Brahem, which is a Tunisian uh, oud player. And uh, so uh, it uh, kind of triggered me to go to my own archive and take out some of the ECM CDs I have that uh, uh, kind of go in this musical direction. So, particularly Anwar Brahem's first album, Barzak, um, which uh, is kind of a, almost the entire album is just pure oud playing. Uh, his style is very interesting and unique because he's certainly not uh, beholden to play only a particular kind of North African style. His music is a very um evolved uh, and very much influenced by uh, european and generally mediterranean music and uh, so uh, it's actually quite difficult to kind of put a finger on it just what the style of music is playing i wouldn't say it's jazzy at all although he um, certainly became kind of big name in this sort of oriental jazz fusion sound uh, that I like so much, but uh, not not on this album. This is kind of a very traditional sounding music on the one hand. On the other hand, uh, it's kind of the style is kind of expanded in this uh, sort of timeless, timeless uh, style that uh, merges uh, so the Occidental and the Oriental on the Oud. So um, certainly a very kind of atmospheric album. Um, one of my favorite uh, from uh, his uh, from his catalog is the album Thimer with John Sermon and Dave Holland. This is a wonderful session uh, with Dave Holland playing uh, playing double bass and uh, John Sermon on the saxophone and clarinet. So obviously here you have uh, much more a kind of a jazzy jazz jazz influence. Uh, uh, although I would not, uh, I would not call it a pure jazz album. There is just a lot of kind of a Middle Eastern uh, vibes going on, and kind of a, this typical, uh, typical kind of a Mediterranean, kind of a universal Mediterranean sound that uh, Anwar Ibrahim is so famous for. And finally, probably my favorite album by Anwar Ibrahim is the uh, the Astrakhan Cafe by the Anwar Brahem trio. Well, the, the picture looks out of focus because it is out of focus, so that's not the camera or your eyes playing a trick on you. Um, so this is uh, with uh, Barbaro Sarkoze on clarinet and uh, Lassad Hosni on the Darbuka. Lassad Hosni had already played uh, on uh, the first album I showed you here. So this is a long-term long-term collaborator this is probably my favorite album from the from the Anwar Abraham catalog it's pretty cool record uh, wonderful jam it really takes you on a journey kind of a middle eastern mediterranean journey through north africa probably so um really nice album so i continued with two more albums that i have uh, by the Munich based ECM label by the way one of the biggest blockers on the internet uh, probably only only surpassed by the blocker in chief uh, Robert Fripp but uh, yeah Manfred Eicher and ECM they block everything so unfortunately probably not the type of music where I can offer you some needle drops or something in the near future uh, unless finding some clever solution for that Anyway, this is Kaihan Kalhor and Erdal Ervinchan and their album The Wind. So Kaihan Kalhor is a artist from Iran who plays the Kamanche. And Kamanche is kind of an upright, upright, small violin type of instrument that has this kind of a very 
very emotional kind of soaring uh, string sound uh, that is kind of a very characteristic for the traditional music of this region and Erdal Erzincan is a balama player from the Turkey uh, so balama or the saz is a kind of a lute type of guitar type of string uh, instrument and they bl play together um, this is a uh, this is a album they recorded in Istanbul in a studio um, what they usually do is they just sit down together and this is completely improvised so they sit down together and one of them starts just to develop a theme an idea the other one joins him and um, they can do this like for 60 minutes easy so um, it's kind of a fascinating uh, meandering music uh, that of course you have to be ready for uh, I fully understand that this is not the type of sound that someone would want to be listening to every day um, <coughs> excuse me gotta be in the mood for that uh, or but it's interesting type of music to accompany you during a day if maybe you have to do some chores or working or whatever um, it's not a bad music for that uh, it's an interesting kind of uh, metaphysical music between uh, the Iran and uh, Turkish music so obviously as far as kind of a regional overlapping goes uh, there is a lot of kind of Kurdish elements kind of a East Kurdistan type of uh, uh, musical themes being uh, thrown into quite beautiful and I have a second album which is called uh, Kula Kuluk Yakışırma and uh, I really really cannot translate this title this is just uh, I may have the dictionaries in my library but uh, this is some kind of wordplay I'm I just stuck I don't know what the title of this album means but um, Again, uh, it's a uh, recording of these two um, and completely improvised uh, sessions. But this time it's live music recorded, uh, I think, in the city of Bursa. And, uh, but it makes sound-wise, it makes not that much different because the way they are playing and where they are playing, this is a kind of a very controlled environment. So... Um, it doesn't sound that much different from a studio album with the exception that you may occasionally hear um, the audience in the background. So uh, this is Kula Kuluk Yakushirme by Kaihan Kalhor and Erdal Erzincan. And uh, yeah, that's it for now. Far too much. And if you are still here and listening and watching, thank you for this endurance. You are the greatest. And uh, yeah, I will switch the camera off.